During this time, Frisbee would attend monthly meetings held by Catherine Coleman. And the things you want, love, you have no desire for at all, right? Just went right out. Frisbee was also beleaguered by serious concerns regarding the cleanness of his life. So much so, there were times he was rejected from the pulpit. And he says, come Holy Spirit, and the next thing I know, people are falling and bouncing in her, and they're laying on the floor and they're talking like turkey guys. <laughs> the Holy Spirit fell. <laughs> and then people have been doing this ever Hey guys, welcome back. This is part two on Lonnie Frisbee and the Jesus Revolution, the Jesus Movement, the Jesus People Movement, whatever you want to call it. Let's jump right back into where we were. Lonnie Frisbee has been supposedly called. He's met Chuck Smith. He's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't believe he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think he went and got another spirit at a Pentecostal church, but that's just me. Watch the last video for more on that. And at this point, he started the movement and he's preaching with Chuck Smith. During this time, Frisbee would attend monthly meetings held by Catherine Coleman at the Shrine Auditorium. He reports being drawn to these meetings like a magnet. And he would later be mentored by Miss Coleman. Catherine Coleman, the same false teacher who influenced Benny Hinn, also influenced Lonnie Frisbee very early on in his Christian walk. Imagine that. In fact, if I go too far into the weeds about Catherine Coleman, we're going to be here all day. So I will just say that Catherine Coleman is a very controversial person, and she was controversial from the start. She claims she had an encounter with God at age 14. She became ordained to preach. She pastored a church, which is clearly not allowed in the Bible. Just read what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.12 about not allowing a woman to teach or exercise authority over the men of a church. It's also clear in the pastoral epistles where where Paul is giving the qualifications for an overseer or an elder. But in the Pentecostal church, this is somewhat allowed. In fact, in many modern churches, it's allowed. It's just that those churches aren't really following scripture. But after that, Coleman started an affair with a Texas evangelist named Burroughs Waltrip. And eventually he divorced his wife, left his family, married Catherine. They were together for at least six years before they were separated. And then eventually they were divorced. And people who defend Catherine try to make this like she had a really short marriage. She knew she'd made a mistake immediately and she was barely married to the man at all. And they try to change the facts around here. But similar to Lonnie Frisbee, Catherine was living in a significant amount of sin while she was preaching and pastoring. She was very willful and intentional about it, and she continued to seem very unrepentant about this for the rest of her life, in my opinion. She talked about it as a mistake that she'd made that God had forgiven her for, and she basically went on the offensive against anyone who ever brought it up. And instead of being known for her great knowledge of scripture or her godly example and holy life, Catherine was simply known for this same powerful anointing that Lonnie Frisbee was also known for. And we'll further examine why that is as the video goes on. But watch how Catherine directs Lonnie's statements in this interview as Chuck Smith sits next to Catherine, smiling and nodding. How has he changed your life, Lonnie? Well, the Lord says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away and behold, all things become new. He's changed me all around. Really? Inside out. Through and through. <laughs> <laughs> and the things you want, love, you have no desire for at all, right? Just went right out. Watching that interview, I don't believe her or him. Can we just watch that last segment again where she directs Lonnie to say that his desires are entirely changed? And the things you want, love, you have no desire for at all, right? Just went right out. Yeah, the way he says that is not convincing at all. And she seems like some kind of evil puppet master, like she's a witch that has a spell on Lonnie, and it's not far from reality. She's truly a prolific false teacher, almost a legend among charismatic false teachers, and she gave her mantle to, wait for it, Lonnie Frisbee and Benny Hinn. These false teachers are in a direct succession from one another. Frisbee indicates that South Africa is where he received his powerful anointing, and that he brought this anointing with him when in early 1980 he began attending the Yorba Linda Calvary Chapel, which was pastored by John Wimber. It was on Mother's Day of that year that a remarkable outpouring of God's Spirit occurred, which split the Calvary Chapel denomination into two and propelled the Vineyard Movement into the apparent epicenter of the Spirit's work. 
Okay, I should point out that I will put a link to the person who did this documentary on Lonnie Frisbee below. I'll put it in the description and also in the pinned comment somewhere. But I don't agree with this guy at all. The Vineyard Movement did not become the epicenter of the work of the Holy Spirit. It did become an epicenter of the work of a spirit. All of the weird, hyper-charismatic stuff that's going on now in America and has gone on for the last 40 years, almost all of it can trace its roots back to the Vineyard Movement somehow. Even the Toronto Blessing, it all goes back to the Vineyard. The Vineyard thereafter grew explosively and would send emissaries throughout the world. John Wimber tells of that night. I'm walking out of the church and, and the God says to me, tell that young man to preach tonight. Well, I'm not in the habit of just telling any old young man to preach in my church. And I said, and particularly that young man, because I heard he was a little strange. And I said, Lord, do you want me to have him preach? And the Lord said very clearly to me, yes. So I went up to him and I said, Lonnie. <laughs> So John Wimber, who basically started the Vineyard Movement, just talked to God like it was no big deal, right? God regularly told him, hey, John, go have that young man preach at your church. We're supposed to believe that he wasn't also using Lonnie Frisbee to gain attention. Because remember that Chuck Smith had already used Lonnie to turn a half-empty Pentecostal break-off church into something so large that it couldn't be contained in the building and eventually became its own denomination. And we'll see that Lonnie says specifically that John told him to give his testimony and then to let them have it with both barrels. Which definitely implies that John already knew that Lonnie had this supposed charismatic anointing and that he could use it to shock people, make them fall on the floor, speak in tongues, etc. Which, as we're about to see, is exactly what happened when John had Lonnie preach. Lonnie famously said that he ran in big circles with big bozos. I moved in big circles with big bozos. And he was definitely talking about Chuck Smith and John Wimber, amongst others. And by the way, isn't it always nice that Christian leaders can go away to foreign countries that happen to be pagan, and then they come back to the United States, and oh, all of a sudden they have this crazy anointing that makes people fall down. And they usually put their hand on your head, and the person shakes around. I did this whole thing on the Brownsville Revival, and how it looks just like the Kundalini Awakening from yogic Indian culture. And when a guru puts his hands on you and gives you the Kundalini Awakening, awakening it is called shakti pot and they believe that their ultimate spirit shakti comes into you and does all this work inside of you giving you this enlightening experience and it seems to be the same thing that happens in the hyper charismatic movement again i've done like multiple videos on this but in the brownsville revival steve smith had just come back from argentina where he was a part of another hyper charismatic supposed revival and then he intentionally started the Brownsville Revival. It was very intentional. And Steve Hill was invited to start that revival on Father's Day, whereas the Vineyard Revival was started by Lonnie on Mother's Day. So there's really weird things going on there. And you can't tell me that's not intentional. So let's listen to John Wimber's side of this story about how Lonnie started this crazy charismatic revival. And then he does the weirdest thing I've ever even heard of. <laughs> And he stops and says, well, that's it. He said, you know, the church has been offending the Holy Spirit a long time, and uh, he's, he's quenched, but he's getting over it. And we're going to invite him to come and minister. Now, come, Holy Spirit, and whammo! <laughs> the Spirit of God comes. And people start fighting. Well, first of all, he says, everybody 25 years and under, come forward. Well, in our church, that's everybody. You know, <laughs> they, you know they're all coming up there. So if everyone in your church is 25 years old or younger, you've got to have a really weird church, right? Like, where are the families? Where are the parents with kids? What's going on there? So anyway, Lonnie has all of the youth of the church come forward, 25 and under, and he has all the older people pray for them. And then he gives them his impartation and they all start falling on the ground, shaking and speaking in tongues, all the same stuff we see when people receive a kundalini awakening or when other hyper charismatic movements take place. And look at the way that the people in the crowd are laughing at this, not to mention the irreverent way that Lonnie said, oh, the church has been quenching the spirit, but he's getting over it. You don't want to quench the Spirit of God. God doesn't get over things in that way. He's not a guy down the street who you cut off in traffic. He's the Lord Almighty. He's the creator of all things. 
you don't just offend him casually. There's hundreds of them up all crowded around the stage, and he says, come Holy Spirit, and the next thing I know, people are falling and bouncing in her, and they're laying on the floor, and they're talking like turkey guys. <laughs> and one kid, he falls. One kid, he falls, and the microphone falls with him, you know, and it's laying right in front of his face. And he's speaking in tongues, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about two minutes. I'm talking about 45 minutes he's talking through that microphone. And we're wading through bodies, you know, trying to get over to him. And we can't get the microphone off, and we can't get to him. And Lonnie is going like a banshee. You know, he's running through the crowd and raising his hands. And, you know, and I'm thinking he's pushing people over. He's knocking them down. But he's not even touching them. He's walking by them, and they're going wham, wham, you know, and falling everywhere. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, get me out of here. <laughs> so that's not a church service. That's chaos. Why did Paul tell the Corinthians that if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at the most, and each in turn, and one must interpret? But if there is no interpreter, he should remain silent in church and speak only to himself and God. So in other words, you should not even speak in tongues in church unless it is orderly, each person speaks one at a time, and they have an interpreter. Otherwise, Paul says to keep silent. But you notice he says that they're falling, wham, wham, and they're talking like turkeys, and he makes this big joke out of the whole thing. This is supposedly a move of God, right? The Spirit of God has come here, according to John Wimber. But it's like the funniest thing he's ever seen. It's all a big joke. You will never convince me that this guy is a man of God and that this was a move of God, considering the way that both John Wimber and Lonnie Frisbee both talk about it. I get home, you know, and I, and I try to go to sleep. I, I can't sleep. I get up and I, I go from Genesis to Revelation, you know, and I'm looking for Holy Spirit, come, you know. <laughs> wham, wham, you know. You know. It's not in the book, man. It's not. Right. That's all you have to say. It's not in the book, right? It's not in the Bible. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that. Let's just keep going. Clearly, even John Wimber himself admits that this is not biblical. And this is there. He said, I want you to give your testimony, and then I want you to let him have it with both parents. And I understand. Yeah, shake, rattle, and roll. That's what Lonnie Frisbee had to say about it. He's clearly an anointed man of God, right? People have been doing this ever since. <whistles> oh, that came out of my anointing, he says. Shake, rattle, and roll. If you're not convinced that Lonnie Frisbee was an actual Christian, I have a little more evidence to show you that you're probably correct. For two years following the Mother's Day outpouring, Lonnie Frisbee would minister that powerful anointing with John Wimber. But while so doing, Frisbee was also beleaguered by serious concerns regarding the cleanness of his life. So much so, there were times he was rejected from the pulpit or from personal ministry. Right, so the guy who was supposedly making the Holy Spirit fall and had this powerful anointing and all this stuff was living in sin so much that he wasn't even allowed to preach in the church at times. Here's a thought. Maybe he shouldn't have been preaching at all. Maybe he was never qualified to preach. He should have been stopped in the first place. All of these people should have gone to sound biblical churches and studied the Bible. Instead of chasing after the gifts and the signs and whatever else, Lonnie Frisbee's powerful anointing. Meanwhile, he's over there with a dude and he's doing drugs again. And once again, this led to Lonnie Frisbee's death. I bet in the end, Lonnie Frisbee would have preferred to have been kicked out of the church, but not have died from AIDS in 1993. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
Paul says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not at all mean with sexually immoral people of this world, or with the greedy and swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you to not associate with any so-called brother, if he is sexually immoral, or a greedy person, or an idolater, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For what business of mine is it to judge outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside, God judges. Remove the evil person from among yourselves. So yeah, that's what should have happened with Lonnie Frisbee. Blaine Cook tells of a remarkable incident that occurred when John Wimber was ministering with Lonnie Frisbee at Holy Trinity Brompton in England. Church leadership was concerned about allowing Frisbee to minister, and they discussed this concern with John Wimber. When Wimber decided to replace Frisbee, well, Frisbee became angry and he went outside to cool off. Following the service, people went downstairs into a large area for prayer, where they were packed wall to wall, and Blaine Cook relates what occurred next. He writes, Suddenly I looked to my left up the staircase, and I could see Lonnie at the top. From the top of the stairs he just walked down, putting his hands straight out in front of him, just flat out in front of him, and started yelling in tongues at the top of his voice. When he reached the bottom, he started to walk through the crowd, and it was just like the Red Sea parted. I mean, everybody went down. Everybody who was in front of him just went flying to the right and to the left. It was like a huge lightning bolt hit the people. They all fell down on the ground on top of each other. And that was the beginning of ministry time. It was astonishing. Pretty much the entire room was on the floor. I was off to the side and behind Lonnie when he hit the crowd, so I didn't fall down. And maybe a couple of other people were still on their feet. But the piles of people on the floor literally looked like they had been struck by lightning. It wasn't like they just fell down swooning. They looked like they had been tied to a high voltage electric wire. Some of them cringed and fell down, and some of them fell straight back. Nobody broke their fall or anything. They just all piled up on the floor. A lot of them didn't get up for a long, long time. But Lonnie just turned around, walked out of the room, and disappeared up the steps. So guys, does that sound like the Holy Spirit to you? He was angry, he was unable to control himself, and yet his spirit manifested. It came out, caused him to speak in tongues, and then caused the exact same manifestation as the Mother's Day outpouring, where everyone fell down and shook like they were electrocuted. And that caused all of these people to fall on the ground. Basically, he was using it as a weapon. Can you use the Holy Spirit as a weapon? Because you're angry that you're in sin and they didn't let you preach that day? Does that make any sense to anyone at all? Because that sounds nothing like the Holy Spirit to me. It sounds nothing like a man of God. It's certainly not a demonstration of the fruits of the Spirit, which according to Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Though he did demonstrate many of the works of the flesh which are also listed in Galatians chapter 5, such as immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, many of these traits are things that Lonnie was known for. It's almost like Paul is attempting to describe Lonnie's life, running away from one movement to the next because each one to discovers that you're living in sin and then arguing with people, being jealous, being in disputes with church leadership because you want to be in the forefront with your anointing. And we don't know if a person has the Holy Spirit just because they can knock people down. Take the fresh breath of the Spirit! You may not understand this. I don't either. I don't either. We judge whether or not a person has the Spirit by whether or not they display the fruit of the Spirit. So if you're not showing the fruit of the Spirit, do you have the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? And if you're not walking in the Spirit, then how are you able to use this spiritual anointing? If anyone has any good idea as to how this can work, leave me a comment. By 1982, it became clear to Wimber that he must cut off his association with Frisbee because of his apparent continuance in an unclean lifestyle. And therefore, while some say the church rejected Lonnie Frisbee, there's also much to suggest that Frisbee may have rejected his role as a true minister of the Lord. He was known to harbor a degree of bitterness in his latter days over this perceived rejection by the church. Sir, uh, I, I need to tell you that 
I move in big circles with big bozos. Right. And so he was still angry. He was now bitter, deeper in sin than ever. Supposedly, he says that he fell into sin and backslid in the mid-80s, but apparently he was well into sin before 1980, and it was so bad by 1982 that even John Wimber cut him off. So what happened in the mid-80s that was even worse? I don't think we want to know. So look, it's not like he was doing this great job as a minister. He was really proclaiming the gospel so well. I've seen sermons by Frisbee. Some of them were pretty good. Uh, in all of them, he sounds like a young Christian with not a lot of theological understanding. But look, bad people can go preach a few good sermons. That is not how we determine whether a person is qualified to preach or not. Paul explains the criteria in his letters to Timothy and Titus. And you can't be living in all of this sin and still be pastoring and, and preaching all over the place. So, yeah, that's Lonnie Frisbee. Should we be glorifying this guy? Should we be making Christian movies about this guy? And having a whole generation trying to seek their own Jesus movement, that's scary to me. And here's a thought. Let's have them seek the Bible instead. Let's have them seek the God of the Bible in the scriptures that he has provided for us through his Holy Spirit and preach redemption through the blood of Christ, salvation by faith in Christ, and that a man must be born again by hearing the gospel, repenting, and putting their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, since he is the only Savior. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, we read that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And Lonnie Frisbee may have rightly preached that message, but it's possible to hear it and understand it and repeat it, but not truly believe it, not internalize it, not live it. And I'm not going to speculate as to whether Lonnie was saved at the end of his life or not, but I will say that he looks a lot like a false convert, the way that he was so irreverent when he spoke about God. Lonnie later in life looked nothing like he did upon his original conversion. There seemed to be a point where he looked like he was on fire for God. He was speaking in a convincing way. And it just goes to show you that we never know what's going on in a human's heart. Our faith is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And a person can seem to receive the good news. And they can say a lot of good things. And they can speak Christianese. And then they can go back out into their former lifestyle as though nothing happened. And it's like the parable of the sower where the root didn't take. You know, the seed that falls on the stony ground, it starts to grow. But when it's out in the heat of the sun, it completely dies. And at that point, the fact that its root never really took is exposed. And maybe that was Lonnie. I think it's more of a cautionary tale than something we should be trying to replicate by looking to the gifts and looking to revivals and looking at all the shiny, flashy things when real Christianity is living out your faith. It's continuing to grow. It's continuing to develop your relationship with Christ. It's simple. There is simplicity in Christ. It's not about a new move and a spiritual revival halfway around the world that we need to bring back here and capture the flame and whatever else. It's about desiring God, loving God first, and loving each other as we love ourselves. Well, that's all I have for today. Guys, thank you for stopping back. If you can like the video, drop a comment. That is much appreciated. Let me know what your thoughts are. Or just drop a comment to say hello. Thank you all again. God bless you all. Grace and peace in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ.